We're um, very lucky this today to be joined by Paul Klenerman, Dr. Paul Klenerman, who's a professor of gastroenterology at the University of Oxford in Oxford, England. Um, he's an immunologist who has done extensive work in hepatitis C and HIV, and he's the recipient of the Beyond Celiac Established Investigator Award. Um, also of a very important note is that Paul has been working on a very large product in um, England related to COVID and so um, much of his time has been spent on that extremely important work. So again, we're, we're thrilled, Paul, that you're here with us today to, to talk a little bit about um, the work that you're doing in celiac disease. So if you want to just quickly tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the introduction. So, yes, I, I work in Oxford. Um, I have a background in working in infectious diseases and um, the immune responses to viruses, and, and that led us on to look in, in the tissues, uh, and particularly in, in initially in the liver, and then um, more increasingly um, I got interested in how immune responses work in the gut, and I have very good colleagues in Oxford who work on celiac disease, and they introduced me um, to the problem, and... Uh, we set up some projects to investigate how the immune system works in celiac using some of the principles that we've learned from studying viruses and, and other infections. Okay, so well, you, you did that so well that you answered my first question before I even asked it, which was going to be what drew you to celiac disease research. But in your research, you're looking at a kind of cell, and it has a, a pretty ferocious uh, sounding name. It's the CD8 T cell. Um, that, um, from my understanding, is found in the gut of people with celiac disease, even when they're on the gluten-free diet, and that that cell seems to drive inflammation and tissue damage. And so I wondered if these cells could explain why people on the diet to continue to have symptoms and intestinal damage. Is that kind of where your research is going? And can you talk about your research a little more? Yes, of course. So, yes, yeah, so um, there, there are different kinds of T cells that, that we all have. Um, so they're helper cells and killer cells, and, and we're interested in the, the CD8 cells are the killer cells. Um, and you have both signs in both types in your gut normally. Um, but when you look in patients with celiac disease, that these are obviously changed because there's an immune response going on in the gut. And lots of work already is focused on the helper cells. And the helper cells are the ones that, that also help you create the antibodies and the antibodies are the things that are used in the tests that people are familiar with. But the killer cells can actually be involved in the tissue damage. So the thing is that um, we don't know a lot about those cells um, and well, we haven't up till now really focused on what they're responding to and, and why they're causing damage. Um, sometimes once you've got a kind of activated killer cell, it can cause damage anyway. But, but when we've looked, we find that they, they have certain marks that mean that suggest that they're actually responding to something particular. But what that particular thing is, we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, so the, 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 your question about the DART is really interesting because we know when we study the patients that in our own clinic who, who well controlled on the DART that once you set up an army of these cells, they kind of camp out um, in the tissues, the so-called resident memory. Um, and that means it's usually a good thing because um, it's there to protect you against an infection. So next time you see it, the, the, you know, you've already got sort of forces available at the, at the front, but in the case of celiac, obviously it's not helpful. So that's probably one of the reasons why um, it's, you learn a lot more about what's going on from studies of the tissue than just on the blood, because some of these cells are not really showing mm -hmm. up easily in the blood. Um, so that's really what we're focused on at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So uh, you had to take a bit of a break from the work that you're doing <clears throat> in celiac disease because of the pressing need in COVID-19 research. But when you uh, started to do that, you said that some of the approaches in your celiac disease investigation would apply to COVID-19. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so well, I think, you know, the, this is really uh, important. Lots of people have been, you know, contributing to, to understanding COVID-19 from lots of different backgrounds. And most people weren't working on c coronaviruses, they're working on other things. And the approach that we've taken to celiac disease to work out which cells are, are doing what um, is exactly what's needed to understand some of the key questions in, in COVID. Um, obviously, in Oxford, we're very interested in the vaccine, but we're also interested in... Um, 
how it is that some people do very badly and other people actually shrug the thing off with with much less uh, uh, you know severe illness um and the the type of t-cell response that you make is part of the picture it's not the only thing in the same way as the t-cells are not the only thing in celiac uh, but we have used some of the same tools that we developed for the celiac project and, and some of the same investigators are involved um, and we know that some of the, you know i mentioned that sometimes these types of t-cells can get turned on anyway and just get, get angry and, and aggressive even if they haven't got a good reason to that that appears to be part of the process that's, that's happening in the worst the kind of cases of COVID-19 you get a very aggressive immune response and some of the cells involved in that are the same cells that we're looking at in, in the celiac project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, it uh, hopefully will help lead to um, some of the important answers. Um, as I had mentioned earlier <clears throat> you are the recipient of the Established Investigator Award which is designed with an emphasis on immunology and supporting novel approaches to understanding celiac disease. Um, why are these two things, that is an emphasis on immunology and supporting novel approaches, important? And what would that really mean to the average uh, celiac disease patient who's kind of following research? Yeah, I think it's a good question. And I know we, we like to be driven um, by the, the patients themselves. And I've sat on in committees in the UK where we've carefully looked at what the patients want. Um, and we at least in you know in, in those studies um, people wanted to understand the why you know why is it happening and they want better uh, treatments of course and, and better diagnostics and so the immunology is of course part of part of the answer to all of those questions um, mm -hmm. I think we're, we're, we're very much at the at the end at the level of kind of trying to understand the why so if we can take it down to the nuts and bolts I think we can figure out a lot more about that um, but I do think that if we have um, very clear killer cells that are that we know are very strongly associated with um with the disease that in itself could form part of a diagnostic that would inform patients about well first up whether they you know are at risk or have have um, have, have celiac if it's unclear or how they're responding to treatment and, and all sorts of other things in between so um I, I hope hopefully we can start to address those problems i mean it's still fairly early days of course but but that's the direction of travel Mm -hmm. So um, then you're talking about, about both diagnosis and disease management as well. Yeah, I mean, the management would be, a, you know, a long term aim would be to say, well, mm -hmm. these are the cells that are responsible and mm -hmm. these are the ones that we really need to either get rid of or train better. Um, and that, that, you know, that's not impossible. It's, a, you know, it's a quite a big ask. But if you think about the things that the immunologists have managed to do in the fields of cancer, uh, and turn on cells that were not working properly and we can turn off cells. If we can do that specifically, um, that would be really fantastic. Um, I mean, it's still in the, the challenges with celiac um, have, have been, that, well, I think that there are lots of them, but, but again, we haven't really known which are the key cells that you really need to, to deal with. And especially if you look circulating around in the blood, you mm -hmm. don't like find the real cells, at least that's what we think. So um, yeah, I think if we, if we can track them down and then train them properly, hopefully it'll be on the case. Right, which of course is, as you said, what patients have said they want um, all around the world. So it's it's a universal thing. Um, I think a lot of people um, who are following research understand that um, research in all kinds of other areas, be it cancer or um, diabetes or, or whatever it is, that there's been a bit of a um, stutter i guess because of so much attention has been focused on COVID, and necessarily yeah. so um where um so i know that you're very involved in in that broader work um in england is the celiac study completely on hold or is it moving forward a little bit or where where is it so um well the the problem with the celiac study was that was a, a mixture of things so over the summer was that um we were just unable to recruit any patients to, to, to study so mm -hmm. uh, they shut all, all, all of that for us because of the commitment to to, to the COVID issue right. um and they also shut our lab for anything that mm -hmm. wasn't COVID. so that that really put the <laughs> brakes on um <laughs> having said that the 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 fellow who's been involved michael fitzpatrick Mm -hmm. did an absolutely brilliant job um, uh, in, in collecting all the data together that we'd already um, you know obtained and writing up papers and, and making sense of it and so he's in a very good place so now the lab is just in the last couple of weeks has reopened um, and the, the uh, process for getting more biopsies of the patients is, is um, 
now we're properly engaged with that. So I think we can start again um, and just hope that we don't get knocked off course quite as quickly. But the, I think overall, with, with, um, with the plans that we got, I think we can make good progress now quite quickly. Um, we, you know, we've got tools that we can use on some of the stored material now. So I think, I think we'll, it, it's actually we're in quite a good place if we can just, you know, have a chance to do this. Right, right. And so in other words, not another um, flare up, I guess, of COVID to the point where things have to be shut down again. Yeah, if it got to that point, I think they, you know, the likelihood is that they would, you know, shut the labs and, and restrict the patient again but um, everybody's hoping that that we can avoid that of course uh, you know globally everybody's facing the same issue but right. I think as long as the lab is open and Fitz is not dragged off to my um, Michael Fitzpatrick is not dragged off to kind of um, the wards again then he's got some really excellent plans to, to prosecute what, what, what we were given the money to do so we we're looking forward to doing that. So that sounds great it sounds like at some point it'll then be full steam ahead so yeah. Right. Well, so I want to thank you again for joining us um, from across the pond, and we're excited to see where the study goes. Well, thank you, and thanks very much for the funding. I'm, I'm really happy to, to talk again when we've got a, a few more things to say about all the things that we've learned. Okay, great. Sounds great. So long. Okay, bye-bye.